So I am Javier Moroni. I work in the Knowledge Discovery Laboratory in the University of Massachusetts. And like everyone else, I will be sitting because I failed to deal with the chat mode. So I need to see it, sorry. In this talk, we are going to talk about the use of programming languages in science. Um, first, I would like to discuss a little about what is a discovery or discovery in science. And it is interesting that the Greek use war related to a Eureka to mean discovery or invention. And by the way, the discovery in science is actually a kind of new concept. For instance, we say that when Galileo discovered the moons of Jupiter, he had a Eureka moment. So for this talk, we are going to talk about, we are going to call this Eureka moment, the knowledge discovery moment. Uh, we are going to, we care about the knowledge discovery moment that happens in the act of programming, in science, right? So we think of programming languages as a tool of thought, uh, we are going to explore the uses of programming languages in sciences and explore the different kinds of knowledge discovery. <laughs> For this exploration, we are going to do three separate analyses, one that is based on calculation, then a, a representation base, and finally simulation. This is representation in here means, for instance, domain-specific languages. So each different use is associated with a different kind of knowledge discovery moment. Uh, the rest of the talk is going to be the analysis of each particular use. And first, we are going to start with a calculation-based use. And the question is, are, computing, are scientists using computers as a giant calculator? And this is a concern that people had in many years. For, for instance, Vannevar Bush, a pioneer in computer, he was worried that people see computer as just a calculator. And what do we mean with calculation device? In a, in a semantic level, we mean this. Like uh, what you can do with a programmable calculator. In an operational level, we mean batch processing. So, again, this talk is about the uses in science and you have to think about that, right? So, if you think of Fortran, for instance, the following workflow but, um, was very common, right? So, you first code your problem, then you compile, you execute, and you get your result. And the knowledge discovery happened with the result, right? There is an issue with this and is that between the coding and the result, there is time. <coughs> uh, with the introduction of Lisp, the, this, the red able print loop changed this. Now you have a small, small size of workflow that allows to the knowledge dis discovery create, allow you to create proofs and to do exploratory analysis and so on. So now we have many environments that use the REPL in the science, for instance, Mathematica, Jupyter Notebook, our studio, MATLAB. Interestingly, this environment have code, visualization, and data in the same place. And also, Mathematica, Jupyter Notebook, and our studio exploits the researcher's notebook metaphor, which is interesting. Um, the first case study for this kind of use is going to be Quanticon. So I am an economist myself, so I, I kind of like this project because, okay, I like the idea. Uh, this is an open source project and the idea is to create and document uh, computational tools for economics. And it's very large effort with commits from a Nobel Prize and everything. So it's very important. And the idea is that they take uh, papers of economy and they kind of pour into Jupyter's notebook using the notebook metaphor, the formatting and everything. 
And also, you have the code in the same document. So they create uh, lecture notes with the code. And the formatting is at the right, right level. But if you zoom at the actual code, what we see is that the semantic level are just operation with numbers, vectors, matrices. And this is a very calculation device used. Also, you have data handling nuisances. For instance, reshape, uh, edge tag, slicing, and so on. And if we actually see the semantic level of everything, only input, output, and maybe some parameter are the elements on the economic level. So all this, also, it's very hard to relate this with some other thing to have meta to create metaphor and abstraction and all those things actually limit the knowledge discovery to the result of the computation. So basically, you are uh, you get what you expected to get, right? So there are no novelty, no, nothing uh, new appears except the result of the computation, right? So we can create this diagram. And we see that both input and output are the only thing that are at the level of economics, while the rest of the programs are in the semantic level of numbers, very low level. Now we are going to move to the representation, uh, <coughs> in particular domain-specific languages. So domain-specific languages are especially craft languages that contains uh, elements proper of their domain that they are modeling and uh, this reduce the nuisances for general purpose computation. When we think of the knowledge discovery moment that this <coughs> specific language is allowed, the first one that we may think <coughs> of is when the researcher built on top of the concept already crystallized in the, in the language, right? This is when the researcher used the domain specific language. But there exists another knowledge discovery moment that was happened at the time of the design of the language. Because in the design, you have to model the concept of their domain. Right? You have to create the axioms. And this allows you to, to maybe to discover new things. So when the researcher built on top of this concept, this is maybe related to new to Kuhn's idea of normal science because the paradigm is already crystallized in the in the, in the programming language. Um, when you design the domain specific language, there are two things that I would like to highlight. First, that it appears before the use, the actual use of the domain specific language, before the execution. And second, it is only offered to the designer of the domain specific language and this is actually practically super important um, so there are methodologies to design domain specific language one is semantic driven design and the idea is to first model um, the semantic domain and then to model or design the language syntax to model the semantic domain is to find the basic object <coughs> and the relations while the syntax, or to design the, the syntax is to find the way to construct those objects right? and to combine and everything uh, I would like to highlight that finding the basic semantic object and the relationships <coughs> is super important to science in particular to knowledge discovery mode right? because when you are working in, a, in your domain, you want to see okay, what, what is my, which are my basic objects, how the subject relate, and everything. So a corollary of this is that creation of domain-specific languages should be encouraged to the science, and with this I mean should be encouraged to the domain scientists. Right? We are talking about biology, the biologist should try to create domain specific language and not to be only consumers. So the first case study of domain specific language is MathMorph. This is a 
domain-specific language written in a small talk in the late 90s to work interactively with mathematical objects. So as is typical, or not typical, it may happen in a small talk. In this case, text is one possible interface. And here also we have visual objects. For instance, um, these are polynomials that you can compose, evaluate, inspect, do things with the polynomials. But also, uh, text is another interface. Here uh, we have a, a strap of, the, of a class definition, a homomorphism. <laughs> and according to the author of this project, uh, when they did this, now the, the mathematical object or concept becomes more concrete. And, it, and this is very related to some idea of sigma pattern, right? The, about the concretization of ideas. Uh, we are talking about homomorphism, so it's a kind of abstract idea and it's interesting. And so um, they say that the barrier between the formal definition and the intuitive ideas vanish, and then the formal definition becomes instruction or a specification about how to move from a blackboard to the squeak environment, to small talk. <laughs> also, I would like to highlight that they use a small conceptual unit and very meaningful names. <laughs> and this creates understanding of the concept of a nomomorphism and this may yield uh, more knowledge discovery moments. And according to the author, actually, indeed. Um, we can contrast MathMorph to Quanticon and beside the coding styles, which are very different, uh, in MathMorph we see an intentionality towards understanding through code. And this intentionality involves every identifier. And to me, the names are fundamental element of this objective because the names ground the semantic level. Um, now we are going to move to a second example of domain-specific language. And these are going to be probabilistic programming languages, which are um, domain languages to work with probabilities. But before talking about that, I will show you or introduce you to the idea of a Bayesian network. So this is a Bayesian network. It is a formal tool to work or to think about joint probability distribution. And it has a actually <coughs> a history that is related with computing. But it is a directed acyclical graph where each uh, node is a random variable and it has a conditional probability table associated with it. Uh, what is interesting is that probability programming languages allow you to model this kind of problem um, in a way that is more direct, right? So you can model e every element of the Bayesian network uh, directly into code because, uh, well, uh, well, I would like to say this. Probabilistic programming languages are regular programming languages with two special keywords. One that allows you to generate samples and another one that allows you to condition on observation. Uh, we can generate the same query. So the idea in here, we are modeling, so it is cloudy, um, we have some sprinkler, it may rain, and uh, the wet may or may not be, uh, the grass may or may not be wet, right? So we want to know, we know that the spring is on and the grass is wet, we would like to know the posterior distribution of rain, right? We can answer the same query using a general purpose programming languages. And here we build the conditional probability distribution and then the shine distribution, uh, condition on the observation, answer the query. But this is another method that only works with categorical variables. 
we lost the sense, the causal sense, and more interestingly is that probability programming language allows us to think in a generative and uh, probability way. Then we, we can think on we can think about features proper of a probabilistic model. For instance, the interventional operator, the dual operator of should be a pair, I don't know if you're familiar with that, or the probabilistic assert. Those things are natural to think in this programming language. Um, finally, we are going to talk about uh, programming languages as simulation tools, in particular uh, as modeling tool, in particular simulation. So we can draw a map of the, the use of programming languages in sciences, and probably the most use of programming languages is a statistical inference, which is a calculation-based approach. But also, a lot of people in the social sciences using, use simulation. What they share something in particular, which is that both relies on the execution of the program, but simulation has the domain model in the program, this, and this is interesting. Uh, from all the kind of simulation, I would like to talk about agent-based models, which is something that is very used in economics, and social, sociology, political science, etc. So the basic elements are the agents and the relationships. And the, the knowledge discovery moment, the first one that appeared is with the execution of the program and for instance we can see the emergent behavior or the consequences of perturbation right? but there exists another knowledge discovery moment that is interesting and this appear, appears with the modeling at the time of the modeling because when you model uh, you have to create or use assumptions between the agents and the relations. And I think it will be interesting if the programming languages help us to make this assumption explicit. And regarding this idea of making things explicit, there exists an overview design detail. This is an old standard. It's quite old. Uh, and the idea, they had a problem that people communicate, they say that people communicate the models verbally without references to equations, rules, and schedules. <laughs> so they need a document that describes the model. And to me, this is odd because uh, every model has actually some code, right? It runs some code. So you need a document that describes the code and maybe this is a failure of programming languages as communication device as a way to communicate the model um, because of time I'm not going to talk about NetLogo but this is the case study that I work on the on the paper um, it is interesting actually, the use of NetLaw in simulations and there are some things that should make us think about what is happening and I talked a little about the body syntonic idea of power, etc. Um, and the second uh, case study, this is actually it was provided by one reviewer it's about executable cell biology. So we draw this map of the uses of programming in social sciences and we can do something similar with programming in biology. <coughs> but we add another level or category which relies on formal properties. So the idea is that you write your model and then using model checking or sub solver check whether the solutions or your observation actually are compatible with your model and then you can use model refinement to find a better model but I will not talk uh, more about this because this relies on the formal properties and formal properties are quite well studied 
And, but what is interesting now, what this share with simulation is that both model the domain. And I think that is interesting for us. Um, before finishing, I would like to talk a little about some past and future work. Um, and I will start with the future. So the most natural thing to do is to quantify things. This is the kind of thing that people in software engineers did. Uh, for instance, they did size of and they measure size of variables, size of functional DNA, amount of codification. And you can do this for scientific code and for non-scientific code. And try to measure if there exists some causal relation between primary feature and uh, scientific knowledge discovery. But what I think is that before actually going and measuring things, we need a theory to say what thing we need to measure because it's not clear to me that we need to measure. I mean, we, we can measure those things, but the answer, I don't know what it's going to tell. And this is like the second thing that I suggest, uh, has to do with a philosophical-linguistic approach. Uh, so there are some work, uh, a lot of work actually, about uh, sign uh, semiotics, but Many people, I just put some names, Frege, De Socio, Pio. Uh, and actually, uh, Tanaka Ishi, she did a work taking the two sign models, the one of De Socio and the one of uh, Pure's, and apply it to programming languages. And I think it is a good idea to start doing this kind of thing and relate this to knowledge. Another uh, way to go it's actually with the work of Lakoff, um, in particular the idea of conceptual metaphor, because this to me is fundamental for the use of programming in science, right? I, well, he's, he talked about mathematics, but the idea when you model, you are doing some inference preserving, or you expect to have an inference preserving um, cross domain mapping, because every knowledge that you gain from your model, you expect to go and translate that to reality. Um, okay, there are many things to think of uh, on this line. So to conclude, I would like to say that I think we need a theory of knowledge and uh, programming languages, if at least uh, focus on scientific usage. <coughs> uh, it is important to understand the semantic level in programming, and I know that semantics means something different in the programming language. Uh, uh, I don't know, <laughs> people for programming language people. So I mean something different. And here it's some ambiguity. Um, and maybe try to think tools about that facilitates this knowledge discovery moment, right? Maybe some domain specific languages. Don't know because we need to solve some other question before thinking about tools, thinking about solutions. Uh, well, in that way. <laughs> Any question? So yes, I thought this was uh, a great paper. Uh, when, I, when I saw this in the submission list, I, I became confident that this track would probably succeed in in the aims that that the, that the committee has set for it. Um, so yes, this is exactly the kind of work which we were hoping to to, to encourage and uh, reflecting on how uh, programming can inter interrelate with the knowledge discovery process. So clearly, there's an important bidirectional process going on. Uh, as, as computer programmers, we participate in the world we're, you know, it, it, with our hats on as computer programmers. We're called upon to, to deal with phenomena of the world on, on behalf of other people. But then, at the same time, we, we hopefully reflect on our own practices and go through our own process of knowledge discovery. And I guess it's worth just reflecting even more clearly on what we might mean by knowledge discovery. Um, so the, 
the paper, I think, wisely doesn't attempt to give a definition of what a knowledge discovery <laughs> moment is, but helpfully gives some examples of things which the author qualifies as knowledge discovery moments. So, for example, at the conclusion of an experiment when observing the results, or a moment may appear through reflection while creating a new computational model. And I think it's, it's well worth bearing in mind how incredibly messy and confusing a genuine large-scale knowledge discovery moment appears from the point of view of, of people going through it. And the, the paper does refer to Kuhn's two different models of uh, doing science, the, the crossword puzzle solving mode where you are applying essentially well understood rules and properly semantically modeled domain and you're simply solving puzzles with respect to those entities and then you're dealing with paradigmatic shifts of the kind that, that the committee is is seeking to, to promote. And I think anyone who's looked at communities in the process of, of such shifts has to reflect on how impossibly messy, serendipitous, and in, in many cases counterintuitive the results are. In fact, the more closely one looks at any significant scientific discovery, the more often you discover that the perpetrators were in their own minds, perhaps doing not only something unrelated, but in fact the exact opposite. I mean, a great result from, from Lakatos is the famous Michaelis and Morley experiment, which all the textbooks tell us was one of the founding experimental results behind relativity. This is not only completely false, because Einstein didn't give a fig about the Michaelis and Morley experiment, but even more importantly, Michelson believed that his experiment was designed to demonstrate exactly the opposite. He believes the experiment was designed to refute relativity, and even more exciting that he believed he had refuted it. And <laughs> when his Nobel Prize came to be awarded, the, the prize had to be awarded very, awarded very carefully in order to discourage Michelson from giving a speech about what he believed he had achieved. <laughs> 30 years later, he is still convinced that his experiment had decisively refuted relativity, so his Nobel Prize was for the accurate and careful use of instruments. <laughs> so, I think this is the kind of thing that we, we should be careful to realize that we, we, we it's our mission to try to, to tangle with, both on behalf of people that we do, uh, that we, that we work on programming languages on behalf of, but also ourselves. We, we, we should be prepared to be totally wrong about, about what we're doing. And so the question is, how can the artifacts that we've got, for example, DSLs, programming languages, how, how can we hope to extract value from these artifacts we've got in the pursuit of a paradigm-busting knowledge discovery? And so it's clear that, that DSLs will result in what Brian Cantwell Smith calls an inscription error. It's very likely that you'll extract from the use of a DSL largely only the assumptions which which we used to derive it, which, which the speaker carefully noted. But I, I think what we are called upon to reflect on is how could something like a DSL, or how could the network of technologies of which DSLs are a part assist us in, in paradigm-busting knowledge discovery, where, for example, our modeling of the semantic domain is imprecise or even completely faulty. And I think we have to be clear that we should never expect to have to commit to a single modeling of the domain as we're going through the, the knowledge discovery process. We need to be able to entertain multiple, possibly wildly consistent hypotheses, and our modeling tools should assist us to work with these rather than rejecting these inconsistencies. As And so there's this point here. I think it's, it's as important to be able to model misunderstanding as it is to model understanding, because of course what what, what we retrospectively call misunderstanding is simply a, a different historical understanding from the results from a different semantic modeling of the domain. And, you know, people who have been taught by, by teachers often become, often frustrate their teachers with their amazing ability to mis mis misunderstand time and again with the same evidence in countless different ways until they're guided to the correct uh, model of the, of the domain by their by their teacher, but we have to be clear that this can only uh, reflect a kind of of, of wiggery. So um, I can refer readers to this excellent 
uh, five-part article that appeared in the New Yorker a few years ago called Kuhn's Ashtray, which was written by, interesting, I've, I've, I've mentioned his name as Era Morris, but he was actually Errol Morris. Anyway, he was <laughs> Freudian slip. He's, he studied with Kuhn. Uh, and, and referred to this weak interpretation of history, which unfortunately, as computer scientists, we're painfully prone to. In, in the weak interpretation, only today's conceptual model, only today's semantic model is valid, and, and anyone who had a, a prior modeling domain to you was, was incorrect. That is, they indulged in what we now would call a misunderstanding, which is what we call was in, in the minds of students when they entertain hypotheses other than the ones that, as teachers, we're trying to teach them. So. We need ways to bring together the world of scientists and students so that they can hopefully use tools which bear at least some resemblance to each other. No student could expect to be trained to navigate their way to knowledge discovery moments unless they're using tools which could have assisted a real scientist to navigate their way through a knowledge discovery moment with all of its incredible messiness and, and violent contradiction. And I just want to refer to these revolutionary tones which I've, I've brought here, uh, Michael Polanyi's personal knowledge, in which there was a quote on the first slide, and Phil Agri's computation and human experience. These are these are books which I can recommend to everyone on this topic. So I guess we can now go to, to questions for the for the speaker. Well I would like to I would like to say Thank you for the review. Actually, when I wrote uh, this paper, the, the idea is to start a discussion and maybe to write something later to do some more research, to find people to do research. And the review was so uh, interesting that I, actually to add things to my paper from that review is not fair. <laughs> it, like it, it grew up the paper a lot. So, thank you a lot. It's very interesting. And also, I would say, I would like to say something about the students. Um, I haven't mentioned, I haven't talked about the students in my presentation because what I see is that there exists a lot of, it's not related to the a lot of paternalism in the mm -hmm. sense that we want to teach kids yes. to program, right? right? And it's like the economists. Uh, they need to program what well too, I mean, and they are not the students, they know a lot of things. Uh, the same way apply like with biology and everything. So I, uh, I decide not to talk about the students and instead to focus in research. That they know a lot of math. Uh, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Any questions? So, um, are you aware of Umberto Eco's search for a perfect language? Uh, uh, it's a book he wrote which is a catalog of historical attempts to build a language in which only truth can be spoken. <laughs> um, uh, 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 this was the pre Babelian language that we, uh, that we all successfully communicated in. It seems like on one side we have um, the perfect language. Yeah. And on the other side, we have languages that have no distinguishing power between the meta assumptions being completely valid and complete nonsense. Um, it seems like uh, the, <laughs> you're arguing for one point on the spectrum. You might be arguing for a slightly uh, a, a point slightly shifted towards more. No. no. No? Okay. <laughs> I would say why no. Because I am not arguing uh, I'm not arguing for any point. My, my only idea is to acknowledge that we need to understand more things. That there are things that we are doing that could be improved. I, I don't know the answer to this question. I don't have actually a clear idea of the question. I, need, I don't really have a clear idea of the question I'm asking. <laughs> <laughs> and we're all behaving exactly as we should be. <laughs> well, um, sure. Any other great discussion points? 
Mysterious. I can ask Antronek the same question. What? Where on the spectrum do you want to be? Between a language in which only three things can be said and a language which makes it has no distinguishing power between um, truth and nonsense. <laughs> <laughs> is this a political comment? <laughs> no, not at all. Um, well, as, as Dr. Johnson remarked, there can be no settling the precedence between a Laos and a flea. I mean, clearly a language in which only truth to be spoken is self evident, the impossible description, and similarly a language which, which exerts absolutely no bias between reliable conclusions and, and faulty ones is also unachievable because that language itself would be constructed by us. But I think we would, we would presumably want to be as, as, close, as close as possible to the, to the left end, that is, the, the, the language which, which reads as little into the, the state of the world as possible. And this is an attempt to avoid inscription errors. Avoid inscription errors and to speed the, 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 the process of paradigm busting because we're much more likely to be stuck in ruts as we are to entertain wildly impossible conclusions. I mean, most of us, you know, we're much more likely to, to think the things we thought yesterday as we do today, as we are to just wildly change our, our, our hypotheses uh, with, with every fact that blows in the wind. So I think, yes, we, we, need, we need systems that are, are rut-busting. Yeah. Uh, so you say something like languages were only the true, I say, or something like that. I don't remember the Languages in which only truth can be spoken. <laughs> yes, well, I would like to say something in particular regarding this, and it has to do with the semantic level. Uh, maybe we have those languages, but the problem is that we have to be able to read that. That's the thing we care about, I care about. For instance, when economists write a lot of numerical things, they probably have a new discovery there, but they were not able to see this before because they are not knowledgeable on that thing that they are doing. Reading is important. 